Twisted Metal was one of the very first titles on the original PlayStation. This car combat series made a name for itself during the fifth generation and went through quite a bumpy road shortly after. In this retrospect, we'll take a look at each of the games and their development history with... This is David Jaffe. I am the co-director and co-creator of Twisted Metal franchise. Let's start from the beginning, or perhaps even before that. David is originally from Alabama, but attended the University of Southern California. That's right, LA, where dreams happen. And his dream was to be a filmmaker. I went to college to be a film director. I wanted to make movies very badly since I was a kid. Unfortunately, what rings true for certain career choices was still the case back then. Getting a degree in filmmaking proved to be a big risk. I got into video games as a tester just as something to pay the bills while I was waiting for Hollywood to notice me and buy my scripts and give me a shot. And so I needed to make money. And I found a testing position open at Sony ImageSoft. Figuring that video game testing and design would be a little job to hold things over, anticipating that his movie directing gig would rise from the ground. He soon realized there was more than one way to tell stories the way he wanted to. I started as a tester there and I guess I would have probably continued pursuing film, but it was right around the time when video games were starting to dovetail into taking storytelling and taking world building a, a lot more seriously. And so I found that I had the opportunity in my current job that I was already getting paid for to express that kind of creativity that I thought I was only gonna have the opportunity to express in film. And so I just kind of started doing it at work there at Sony and the career took off and I never really looked back. Keep in mind, this was before Sony's first console, the PlayStation. Shortly after he got comfy in his position with Sony ImageSoft, he would become the lead designer of a very early PlayStation title that... Well, let's get right into it. The mid-90s would realize new competition for the Nintendo powerhouse as Sony was getting ready to launch the PlayStation across the world in 1995. While Nintendo maintained an early grasp on how to gain great Western support by the likes of Rareware, creators of the multi-million hit Donkey Kong Country series, David felt there was a notable deficiency in quality on the Western side of Sony's development. We were testing multiple games a day. We were testing things like Skyblazer and Hook and Cliffhanger. And the interesting part was the games that came from Japan, specifically Skyblazer, Hook, and Spawn for the Super Nintendo, were all really, really, really good games. There was a quality to them. There was a, a craftsmanship to them that, to be perfectly frank, we weren't seeing in the games that were being developed in the West. And so the Japan folks came down to show us uh, that video of... PlayStation 1, it was mind expanding. It was like, wow, we can start thinking about video games in an entirely different way, which was quite exciting because it was just like, holy shit, we've just totally had a brand new literal dimension opened up for us in video game creation. And what are we going to get to do with it? This was a calling for him. He had to prove that Western developers can provide excellent gaming experiences with Sony's first console across the globe. David really started to see the true potential of 3D gaming with these early PlayStation previews, but learned that he and his friends were causing problems with other developers at the time. I had a design partner at Sony, Mike Guillaume, and we had pissed off a bunch of developers in America because we were very, it's our way or the highway, and we were very tied into our visions. And we, we were trying to basically be as, hold the line as a Stanley Kubrick without having the talent or the history of Stanley Kubrick. With this rocky relationship between him and Sony developers, it's surprising how simple the story is behind his team being granted a chance to make a wholly original game far away from California and those developers he was pissing off. So a lot of the developers were like going to our bosses and saying, we'll make games with you guys, but you can't send these fuckers anymore because they're driving us up the goddamn wall. And so I remember our boss pulled us into his office and said, look, there's this developer out in Utah. They've been doing military simulations for a long, long time. They're at the forefront of 3D. We think they'll be great to get into 3D gaming. 
because most game developer companies don't have any clue about 3D gaming yet. It's all brand new, and these guys have been doing it for well over a decade. A group that was making simulation games for the military around this time, and what David was exposed to really opened his eyes. And he said, but look, you guys cannot fuck this up. This is your last chance in regards to pissing off these teams that you're working with. You have to sort of embed yourself in a way that they want to actually work with you and they don't want to murder you. We went out to single track, which they weren't called single track at the time. They were called Evans and Sutherland. And it was a group within Evans and Sutherland that ultimately broke off to become the game developer single track. And that was insane because it was really the first time that I had experienced real time 3D interactivity. And when I went out to Evans and Sutherland and I was able to sit in a cockpit of a F-16 or I think F something, I don't know planes, but and actually fly the thing that the military guys used to train in. The minute you really got your hands on, holy shit, I can walk around and be lost in this 3D world, it was the holodeck for me. And it was amazing. And so we're leaving that meeting and going, I don't know what I have to do to stop being such a pain in the ass to developers, but I got to figure it out because I got to get in on this. This is fucking amazing. After being blown away by the early previews, Jaffe got his act together, not wanting to squander this big opportunity. But what does this have to do with his first PlayStation title? And that very trip, we were like, okay, we love these guys. We want to work with these guys. What do we want to make? And we were getting our bags from LAX and we were getting in a cab at LAX. Coming back from that career changing trip, we were stuck in 405 LAX traffic. And that was when we said, oh my God, you know, it's peanut butter and chocolate. If we put this fantasy of wanting weapons on our cars to blow all these fuckers in the traffic away, and we mix that with what we just saw out in Utah, which is holy shit, this is the future of gaming. A rather cynical way to come up with a game, but whatever works. There have been plenty of action racing games during the 16-bit era, but nothing that was pure car combat with truly explosive weaponry. Thus, the birth of Twisted Metal. Which at the time, we called Battle Cars. And it was called Battle Cars for the longest time, and I remember how we pitched it to Sony. We had a meeting, Sony ImageSoft product development, and it was Sony ImageSoft marketing. And they're like, okay guys, we have about two or three slots for PlayStation games. We want to be on this system. Let's go around the table, tell us what you guys want to make. It was that simple back in the day. I mean, the game cost $850,000 to make. It was not, you know, the end of the world if it sank or swim. It was a big deal for us, but it wasn't like today where you're spending a hundred plus million dollars and you've got to get buy-in from all the territories all over the world. It was literally sitting at that table. It comes around to me. I say, we want to do this thing called battle cars. The marketing guy says, what is it? I'm like, it's just cars with guns in a 3D environment. He's like, cool, you got it. That's your green light. I mean, it was that fucking simple and it was that easy back in the day. Unfortunately, things were not going well once the game started to really form. Single Track was creating another game at the same time called Warhawk, which focused on flight combat. You know, we moved forward with that and we moved forward with a game called Warhawk. Ultimately, my partner and I, Mike was one of the designers and I was one of the designers. Our boss was like, look, you guys can't work on them both. There's too much work to do. Who wants Twisted Metal or Battle Cars and who wants Warhawk? And we're like, well, we think they're both pretty fucking cool. We flipped the coin and I won the coin toss. And I said, okay, I'll take Twisted Metal because that seemed pretty cool. Both this and Twisted Metal were being shown behind closed doors in order to receive internal feedback. Although Twisted Metal was having a hard time receiving attention. Everybody thought Warhawk was going to be the bell of the ball. I remember we had a marketing meeting where we showed all of the product development titles that we were coming out with and Twisted Metal was there and Warhawk was there. And two of the marketing guys that don't recognize me are like basically raving about how cool Warhawk is and how much it's going to totally sell. And nobody's saying shit about Twisted Metal. The atmosphere was proving to be unkind to David's project. They wouldn't say a word about Twisted Metal, perhaps out of politeness, but anyone can tell you what that really means. On the other hand, the playtesters weren't too polite. And Twisted Metal got the crap kicked out of it in focus tests that we did to the point that I was convinced my career was over because we had a bunch of hardcore Street Fighter guys come in and they were like, this is crap, this is stupid. I mean, they were fucking mean as shit. Old school NeoGAF had nothing on these guys. It doesn't help that Sony specifically fished for fighting game experts to play test the game since, as far as they were concerned, Twisted Metal would be marketed as a fighting game with cars. Although David really brought this feedback upon himself without realizing it. 
I was pitching it around as sort of Mortal Kombat in vehicles. I mean, Mortal Kombat was ruling the roost at the time. I was a huge fan of Mortal Kombat 1 and 2 and whatnot. Things like that really kind of, you know, had their hooks in the, the DNA of the Twisted Metal series. So it's like Mortal Kombat and Cars, or it's like Mortal Kombat meets Doom. Doom was another game that was still really big at the time. And so that probably is what drove the marketing guys to say, let's pull some fighting guys then, because Jaffe keeps calling this a fighting game. And I still call it a fighting game, but I think it's so literal that really, I don't think we had the language at the time for me to call it what it really was, which is sort of a 3D arena brawler, which there weren't a lot of those at the time. Keep in mind, this is before games that defined the 3D arena brawler subgenre like Power Stone or Anarchy Reigns were even an idea. If games like those existed back then, that would have been a much more fitting description for Twisted Metal. On top of that, Sony of Japan had some very interesting suggestions on how to make it more palatable for their own region. I do remember the Japanese looked at the game and said, can you guys replace uh, the weapons with fruit and tomatoes and vegetables and things? So it's like food fight meets Twisted Metal. And we were like, I'm sorry, what? You want me to do what? Um, and so we never did that, of course, but also we've never been successful in Japan. Japan wants nothing to do with Twisted Metal. While it may sound like a joke, some Western games do see noticeable changes in order to accommodate what publishers think will make the game more financially viable for their region. We're talking more than just simple censorship here, by the way. I mean, I don't know how legitimate it was in regards to, like, did it go up the chain of command, but I know we had our Sony counterparts out sending us emails or whatever we had at the time saying, hey, here are some things we think you might need to do to make this palpable to the audience in Japan. And it was like, could you get rid of the missiles and make them tomatoes and watermelons and whatnot? So, you know. As the game was nearing its launch, Jaffe was ready to throw in the towel for his potential career. I called my wife at the time and I said, I need to find a new career because this we're done, you know until the game came out and sales numbers rolled in. Warhawk was a great game. A lot of people have fond memories of it, but it turned out for whatever reason, uh, I like to think because it ended up actually being a really fucking good game. But when Twisted Metal did come out, it really did catch a lot of people's imaginations. But we had no idea it was going to be successful at all up until weeks after it released. A real sleeper hit for them, selling over 1.5 million copies, three times the amount Warhawk ended up selling, which released five days after Twisted Metal. It also won Game of the Year from Electronic Gaming Monthly. This low-budget project became a rousing success as an early PlayStation title. The gameplay itself was solid, but also very basic, even haphazard at times. There's no real finesse to how it was made, and unlike other fighting games, they didn't put utmost consideration to the nitty and gritty like the more acclaimed fighters out there. None of us had ever really made a game like this at all, and most of us had never made a game to begin with. And so everything was brand new and everything was like, what the fuck are we doing? But it, it was fun. There's no hit boxes and shit. It's like, you know, it's like, it's a very sloppy fighting game. It's as simple as what you're witnessing. Tour across towns to destroy your enemies with whatever weapons you can find in the area. The developers felt the idea of car combat was still a mere bud, given the budget and time frame to make this title. One of the concepts that never saw the light of day for the franchise would be a massive open venue that intertwined between the battle arenas. The first four levels of that game were all one massive level. The freeway level, the park level, the warehouse level, the arena level, that was one giant level. And then you had the suburban level, and then you had the rooftops level. We realized almost at alpha that, holy shit, this game is going to be way too fucking short if we do that, because even though we have this massive level, we can only populate it with eight cars. And once those eight cars are destroyed, what do you do in the level? We didn't have any content. So I remember the longest fucking walk I ever took on the beach with a friend of mine. And I was just telling her, I'm like, I don't know if this is right. I need to tell him to cut the levels, cut the levels, cut the levels. We finally just said, fuck it, let's do it. And it worked out. But that was absolutely terrifying because for a year, we had been playing Twisted Metal on this massive Grand Theft Auto size map. And that's what we knew Twisted Metal as. And it was only a month and a half before it was on store shelves that we said, fuck it, let's cut it. This one decision ended up defining a key design element for the entire franchise, quick arena fights that lead to an ultimate showdown, rather than meshing everyone up together at once. So, big wide open world was out, but let's talk about what made it in. 
What's better than blowing up heavily armed vehicles controlled by computer players? How about ones controlled by your friends? Versus mode is a given, right? Come on, the console has two big ass controller ports. Take advantage. Multiplayer became a big element to the Twisted Metal formula. Despite that, it was also only two months before it was on store shelves when a programmer came in over the weekend and said, you know what, let me try to do split screen on this. And multiplayer was thrown in as just a, hey, what do you think of this at Alpha? And it was like, oh, this is really fucking fun. It was never intended to be a multiplayer game. And that ended up making it sort of the legs of that game and made it what makes that game so goddamn great. It's kind of amazing considering it took just one talented coder to look at this project, give something a try, and see if the director would like it. Not only did he love it, but it would become a staple for the entire series. That drive to provide something unique is what defines the team that David works with. It's just fucking luck in a lot of ways. It was talent, but it was also a lot of fucking luck. The story within Twisted Metal maintains a consistent narrative for the entire franchise, but that's not to say it gets repetitive. Something you'll see as we go down these ravenous tales of contestants looking for their personal paradise is that the story shines through the drivers and what they want. However, this aspect of the game wouldn't be completely fleshed out until the sequel. A powerful and mysterious man named Calypso holds a contest known as Twisted Metal, and the winner gets any wish they desire granted, no matter what it is. The endings weren't anything groundbreaking, nothing more than scrolling texts with little to no imagery. So the movies ended up getting a single frame of Calypso with some text, and a couple movies got a little bit of extra treatment, like a car spinning off into the galaxy and shit when it was outlaw and whatnot. And they were, they were horribly unsatisfying endings. However, there was supposed to be ending movies with live action actors for each character, as you saw in their profiles. This is it? This is gonna make, bring me back to life? It will. Back to the wife you left behind. Back to the little girl you've never seen. Back to the world of the living. Thank you, Calypso. Thank you, my God. God, thank you, Calypso. I feel great. I, I feel alive. I, I, I feel... Betrayed. What? No. <laughs> don't. Please, don't. I give it, and I take it away. Try again next year, driver! Calypso, no, please don't. Because again, Mortal Kombat, right? So it was like live action. This was still the heyday of FMV and shit. FMV stands for full motion video, like a lot of Sega CD games. And I was like, fuck it, I, I went to film school, sorta. Let's make some fucking movies. It's clear that this came from David's yearning to get that directing job for films, something that would creep up throughout this series multiple times. Here we get a glimpse of this visionary's talent. I need a driver. Someone to travel the world and search for new drivers for each year's competition. You'll never die. And you'll drive forever. What do you say, Mr. Kane? Sounds good to me, baby! Okay, I won't just smile and say this is amazing. It's extremely rough, and some of this is certainly laughable. You know, there's one sequence when a character named Mr. Ash comes to take a character away named Black, and Black's just a guy standing there in a, a fucking tablecloth with uh, Christmas lights for eyes, right? And some fucking paper mache horns. It, it is terrible. And you, Black. I granted you more power than I gave any other demon, and you left. You left me. And then Mr. Ash comes out of his semi-truck, which wasn't a semi-truck. It was two lights in some smoke. We're up on a ladder because we couldn't afford the semi-truck. And uh, he takes this, this, this mystical canister that's supposed to house the soul of Black the Demon, and it's literally a Folgers coffee can. So when you see him open it up, you see the little lid kind of go up. This is like supposed to be our version of the Ark of the Covenant and Raiders. And instead this lid comes up and kind of goes boing, boing, boing and flips back and forth like it weighs nothing. No! Black! Where are you going? No! <laughs> what are you doing with Black? Ah! No! No! 
even to this day, my ex-wife will make fun of me. She'll look at me and just kind of go back and forth, rocking on her heels, going, Black, where are you going? Black, it's so bad. But with a budget of about $180,000, it's rather impressive he was able to get all these different actors and scenarios together. While it may look like some shitty 80s movie you've never heard of, Jaffe and his crew were simply doing their best with what they had, and I think it's fair to say these endings and their structure are intriguing, if even at a surface level. It wasn't like I was looking at them going, I'm gonna make some cheesy B-movies and that's the intent. That was not the intent. The intent was to make Creepshow, Twilight Zone, really cool little short stories. And I don't have that skill, I don't have that talent. We didn't have the budget really, so the effects are horrible. The effects are like, first season Doctor Who. In a way, doesn't that make it more special? It's like Birdemic, a film by a complete nut job who probably shouldn't be behind a camera to begin with wanted to make a movie. He didn't intend for it to be the legendary comedy that it is. Just like with these removed endings, the humor people get out of these silly scenes came about naturally because if they tried to make these cutscenes on the same level of goofiness deliberately, well then it would just be like Birdemic 2. In other words, forced and horribly unfunny. Despite their shambled appearance, these endings absolutely would have made finishing the campaigns a lot more satisfying for each character. You... You... You said it would be easy! Do you know what they did? It's my world! It's my word! It's my turn! It's my day! So it was not meant to be bad. The Warhawk movies are bad because they're not only low budget, they're boring. Both of these games chose to take the same direction when it came to creating a story. Twist of Metal would have stood out if it kept these scenes because unlike Warhawk, they wouldn't have been boring heaps of nothing. The strange characters David and his crew wrote are what make these cinematics unique. Even though it was clear people were thinking these are super cheeseball, there was something about them even back then that was connecting with the right kind of people to the point that we had a focus group because there was a big debate internally, are we going to kill these movies or keep these movies? The focus group, which were made up of basically teenagers and young adults, adored them. They were just like, yes, these are fucking stupid and cheesy, but we fucking love them. They're so funny. They're so cool. You have to keep them. I didn't intentionally make shitty, cheesy movies, but we dodged that bullet because the fans like them. They're going to be in Twisted Metal. However, if you couldn't have guessed this due to their absence in the final product, a big problem arose as they were wrapping up development. Word got back to me that a bunch of the folks in Utah, the single track folks, there's a lot of religious folks in that studio, or there were, and it's a, it's a big religious community. And there were key people on the team who we could not have made the game without their amazing talents. It, my understanding is they weren't even that upset with the violence or even the cheese. It was the TNA in those movies. And they were like, look, we, we don't want any part of this. We will walk away from this game and fuck you guys if you put our name on this thing that has these pretty much naked women, you know, flaunt their boobs in the camera as much as i hated it sony couldn't really do anything they, what, what are they going to say we're not going to ship the game it's almost mind-boggling a couple bikinis are enough to miff these religious folks not the acts of killing random people on the streets in the same game if there's anyone david doesn't appreciate it's bible thumping zealots Regardless, he figured it was best to keep the people at Single Track happy and just shove away these endings. I was absolutely sad and angry and upset that we had put so much time into these and then we had proven ourselves by jumping through the hoops of focus test and God damn it, the only thing that was standing in the way were a bunch of religious people. And if you know me at all, who's not religious and I don't really have a lot of appreciation for religion, I was like, are you fucking out of your goddamn mind? You're going to take these movies out that people are saying are making the game better because there's some goddamn people out in the world that are have their knickers in a twist because they see some women's boobs. Come the fuck on. But that's what happened. So I was pissed. Fortunately, they do receive their time in the spotlight years later thanks to the power of the internet. Thanks, TM Alliance. So, as messily put together this game was, it laid out what David Jaffe and his crew always wanted to make with Twisted Metal in all of its odd charm. The game is, by all accounts, across the board, whether you're talking graphics or sloppy controls or the stories or the music or the art style, the game to me is an American garage band game. And I think speaks lovingly and accurately to a certain kind of American experience. It travels a little bit down to South America, it travels a little bit to Australia, but short of that, it doesn't connect in Europe, it doesn't connect in Japan, but I think it is very much a 
it's an American bar band is the way I look at Twisted Metal. Twisted Metal from beginning to end stands as a pure example of American ingenuity and freedom and creativity, for the most part. This could be why it never caught on in Japan. Perhaps the higher ups in Japan knew it wouldn't sell well on its own right from the get go back in 1995. A good amount of Western titles certainly have their audiences in Japan these days, but back then, just about any game that wasn't made in Japan, by devs from Japan, being released in Japan, had pretty much no chance in. the land of the rising sun. It wasn't the most graceful game of its time, but even playing this clunky little piece of wackiness for a little bit now, you can tell this ragtag group did their best showing the world what they're made of. Jaffe sees the original Twisted Metal as his perfect disaster. He didn't have much confidence in the end, but everything worked out great for his crew and it would open the doors for their true potential to really show. <laughs> Shortly after the launch of Twisted Metal, it was a pleasant surprise to David and the people at Singletrack. After such miserable first impressions from players and people within Sony, they didn't think the next thing coming to them was a hearty, congrats, now what's the next step for the series? David and his crew started penciling new ideas right before the launch of the original game, thinking it'd be the last time they would work with Singletrack. So we assumed it was going to be a massive flop. Single Track had already gotten a deal to do something else. I think we assumed we were going to make a Twisted Metal 2. And then after that focus group, we were like, well, that's not happening. Let's figure out what we can salvage. However, once the widespread acclaim for Twisted Metal and booming sales numbers came in, they figured it was best to stick to what people liked. As we were really getting serious about that, the sales and the reviews started to come in on Twisted Metal and we're like, huh? Well, I guess we're fucking wrong. People seem to really dig this. And then we get a Game of the Year award from EGM. And all right, I guess we're just making a straight up sequel. And we were off to the races. Bigger venues, better controls, bigger roster, better environment, bigger weapons, better story presentation. Everything needs to be bigger and better. After all, Jaffe and the crew were not completely satisfied with how the first game turned out, thinking it only haphazardly laid the groundwork for what Twisted Metal can be. A lot of people always say on any game, why is the sequel always better than the first game? And it's because the first game, you're figuring out what the fuck the game is. The popular analogy is you are building the plane while you're flying it. You are making the shit up as you go. And once you know what it is, and once it's connected with enough of an audience, the second game is where you really actually start to go, okay, now I know what this is, let's make it really fucking cool. Twisted Metal 2 was their opportunity to improve what they've already established. A tour around the world for you to explore and destroy landmarks to discover secrets. The most famous easter egg of this game is destroying the Eiffel Tower in the realistically sized city of Paris. Controls in general also saw refinement, something the crew really wanted to focus on. One of the best examples is being able to turn without accelerating. Little changes like this made the game feel better and helped crank the pace as well. Like any good sequel, the developers wanted to improve upon the previous iteration in every single way possible. Although, we can't leave out the biggest change in the gameplay, which were abilities mapped to button combinations. Special inputs with the D-pad that let you protect yourself from upcoming major damage or even freeze opponents. This added a whole new layer of strategy and was exactly what Jaffe wanted in order to make this game a bit more akin to fighting classics. All I knew for me is I wanted it to be deeper and more like a fighting game. And that's when we had a guy, a producer on the title named Hunter Luizzi, and he says, why don't we do it like Street Fighter and literally put in D-pad moves for things like freeze and shield and jump and all that. And I was like, there's no fucking way that's gonna work. You can't do it. You can't drive a car like that. But Hunter was absolutely right. And that was really, I think, the big expansion. I mean, yeah, the graphics were better. The interactivity was better. The quality of the title was better, it was longer, the movies were obviously better, but the biggest real uh, thing that we added to that game that made a big difference was Hunter's idea of taking a lot of the nuanced attacks that I wanted and putting them on the D-pad and saying, let's make it more executed like a fighting game. And even though it still never you know, got into the realm of Mortal Kombat, that really did help people start to think about it more like, okay, I'm fighting these other cars, especially when I'm going one-on-one. In other words, these special moves are what help people see Twisted Metal as something more competitive when it came to multiplayer. Regarding the story, it was expressed through an introduction, small character monologue, and animated epilogues. 
Each ending was done in a still image style that's similar to motion comics. As the first, it revolves around Calypso holding this tournament and the winner would receive anything they desire. Of course, these wishes tend to come with consequences that typically ends up ruining that character's life. I need more speed, she told me. I want to go faster than anyone ever has. As my prize, give me the ability to drive at the speed of light. With a wave of my arms, I called upon my powers and granted Amanda one her ultimate wish. She broke through the barrier and found herself traveling through time. But no one stays on top forever. <laughs> Millions of years later, the only trace of Amanda Watts and her twisted metal victory would be the fossilized helmet on display in the National Museum of History. To the world of science, a helmet so old became an issue of worldwide debate, a great mystery. But to me, it was simply a cruel reminder of a woman obsessed with pushing the limits. I am Calypso, and I thank you for playing Twisted Metal. People constantly compare the structure and concept to be like the famous monkey's paw tale in which the character wielding said paw can wish for anything they'd like, but things turn out grim due to the rules set by the mysterious power of this wish-granting device. While I have no doubt it was an inspiration to how they wrote these stories, that isn't exactly like the tales in Twisted Metal because the writers attack the concept from a different angle, in which the undesired outcome is typically due to the winner messing up their wording or simply didn't think things through. I'm an actor and I'm really, really good and I've been struggling. Searching for my big break for over six weeks. Please, Calypso, you've got to make me famous. Make it so the entire world knows my face. Your wish is granted. Hey, don't touch the face. <laughs> oh, <laughs> nice oh, oh, I can see all the now. There. <laughs> <laughs> when Ken first woke up, he thought he'd been dreaming. But then he looked around and realized he was thousands of feet above New York City. And his face... The driver of Spectre had gotten his wish. Now the entire world knew Ken's face. Might seem a bit childish, kind of like the old joke of wishing for a million bucks and then you get a herd of wild bucks charging towards you. But there's still something oddly enjoyable about seeing the person you were playing as get screwed over, usually because Calypso takes things too literally, or too figuratively. What can I do for you gentlemen? We demand that you give us the ability to fly! Certainly. Have a great time in the friendly skies. Let's go! Wahoo! Hey man, this can't be right. Good thing these first class tickets are refundable. I think I was the main writer on two, and I had great comic book art from our concept artist named Lee Wilson, who went off to work on Halo after this. He was the guy who really designed Sweet Tooth, uh, at least the first iterations of Sweet Tooth. Of course, something that made these tales so interesting is that it didn't always turn out bad for the characters. A few times, what Calypso grants them is exactly what they wanted, and they leave this contest completely satisfied. Axel stood before me and asked me for the one prize he wanted more than anything. The strength to face his father, who had bound him in this hellish contraption over 30 years ago. I thought I'd gotten rid of you. Father, please, release me. You were always too slow, too damn stupid, and you still are. Gonna take ten more years on the wheels to set you right. You need to be taught a lesson. No, father, I've learned my lesson. Let me show you what I've learned. Oh, my God. <laughs> Oh, no. oh my god. I am a free man, and you are no longer my father. There's also examples that show they wanted to provide a bit more than simple gotcha tales when it came to some of these contestants. Daddy? It's me, Krista. I'm back. Krista, I thought you had died. I thought. In the car crash that almost killed me, you're alive. Property of the LAPD. I'm sorry, Father. They rebuilt me after the accident. They knew I could get close enough to you. They want to put a stop to all the violence you cause with your contest. Hold me, Daddy. I'm just a machine now, but I'm scared the explosion will hurt. How the fuck Sony gave me, who had no fucking experience directing, 
to begin with $180,000 to go off and make fucking live action movies. I don't know. The fact that those fucked up so badly, we couldn't even use them. And I somehow was able to get them to give me another hundred X thousand dollars to make more movies. Who the fuck knows how they had faith? I don't know what to tell you, but uh, they did. Yeah, it was across the board. We wanted to improve it in every way. One could say the presentation of these scenes come from David looking back and seeing what would be the best way to go. So yeah, thank goodness for second chances. Among the stories, Marcus Kane provided the most interesting aspect. While his description just sounds like fourth wall breaking nonsense, his ending shows he was telling the truth. He was the most sane person among the contestants and managed to escape this reality. I know it's all a dream. Please, Calypso, help me. Oh, Marcus, I always knew you would be the one to figure it out. I will grant your wish, but please, feel free to come back and visit us anytime. Well, the rest of your friends will be here for quite a while. <laughs> Doctor, he's awake. Good God, son, you're alive. Well, you were in a 25-car pile up on the freeway. It's a wonder you've come back to us at all. The rest are still in comas. These people, they all look so familiar. I've seen them before. Fought them before, but where? Well, I can't remember. This might be satirical cartoon theory fodder these days, but this was mind blowing to me when I was like eight, okay? Now that I've had some time, the answer I usually give is, and this is correct in terms of conscious awareness of it, is when I write a Twisted Metal or I co write a Twisted Metal, each one is standalone. So I don't really necessarily worry about the canon of like, well, this happened in Twisted Metal 1. I'm like, dude, I'm writing Twisted Metal Black. I don't give a shit. It's a standalone. Who gives a shit? You know, that's, that's how I think about it. But there are threads and specifically tied to Marcus Kane, Charlie Kane, Needles Kane, that whole family that continually creep up in the Twisted Metal, you know, fiction or lore. And so in Twisted Metal 2 was really the first time we started playing with the idea that this could all be sort of in some psycho's head. And we really paid that off in black, but there may very well be a really interesting, deep story about twisted, fucked up families brewing underneath the surface. But for me, whenever we've written a twisted metal, I've never gotten to it. I've just kind of poked around at the, at the ground and little things would come up and I would use them. But I have the feeling if I really ever put the effort in and said, fuck it, I'm going to excavate this area that I keep digging in. There is a lot more in common that tie all of the Twisted Metals together, but I couldn't tell you consciously what that is other than it has something to do with a really fucked up dysfunctional family that seems to be up in each other's business constantly. Let's not get too ahead of ourselves here. The most important thing to take away from this is there are indeed connections between the stories some as thin as a single thread, and it's all within the Kane family. Definitely something to keep in mind and shows importance to Marcus's story. Something else to keep in mind is Sweet Tooth also went by the name Needles Kane, and his ending also related to escaping his current reality. And just to ruffle some feathers in the Twisted Metal wiki, there's no canonical winner, guys. At least not in regards to how one contestant can affect the others for future entries. It was based on Mortal Kombat. Well, Kano doesn't always win when Kano wins, that's your alternate universe. When Jax wins, that's your alternate universe. It's not one big story. To this day, Twisted Metal 2 is considered the best title in the series by fans. I think all the games have things they do better than the other games. I think Twisted Metal 2 is probably the essence of what we were going for when it came to the arena brawler light fighting game when you are in split screen and fighting a friend and it feels like a really good fucking strategic but still fun and raucous brawl i think that game does that better than any other and so people i think who have those memories playing with their dads or their friends or their brothers and whatnot that i think i understand why they would say that but it doesn't do the other things as well i don't think we have one that is the best. I think Twisted Metal 2 probably is thought of that way because it, it was the one that came out at the right time where the world and what gamers wanted merged with that design better than any other. Because after that, it's always been diminishing returns in terms of sales. Like more and more people moved on from Twisted Metal after the PlayStation 1 era. And so Black is thought of 
wonderfully, but Black didn't sell what Twisted Metal 2 sold. And 2012 certainly didn't sell what Twisted Metal 2 sold. So the audience gets smaller and smaller because it really was a game of its time. I don't think the IP is of its time. I still think the IP is incredibly rich. I have said over and over lately that I'm not that interested at the moment in making video games right now, but I am incredibly interested in going back to the world of Twisted Metal, whether it's in a graphic novel or a slasher film or just something, because I think that world is totally rich and really fucking cool and interesting. But I think that's probably why they say two is the best though. Jaffe doesn't entirely agree in the grand scheme of things, but it's like picking a favorite among your children. Parents can't do that, I like to think. It certainly isn't my favorite title in the series either. Regardless, I can see why it bears a legacy in PlayStation's library. While the rowdy gameplay certainly helped Twisted Metal 2 stand out and sell even more than the original game, these tales of psychos blazing a path to their ultimate desire cemented what this franchise would stand for. Pure car combat with provoking and deliciously twisted stories. Twisted Metal 2 was a mega hit. While the first title laid the groundwork for its core design elements, this sequel really fleshed out the concept of car combat and was able to find even more mass appeal among PlayStation fans while still retaining its essence. Unfortunately, David parted ways with Single Track as they were contracted to make other games. Losing Single Track, I mean, it wasn't like a mean or an angry split. It was literally the management at Single Track was looking to build their business in a different way. I think they wanted to get more into publishing, they wanted to have a little bit more control. And so they said, you know what, we're not going to keep going with Sony, we're going to sign up with GT Interactive. And so Sony's like, okay, that sucks. We're really disappointed, but we need Twisted Metal because it's it's making a shit ton of money for us. We have a team down in San Diego that's made Rally Cross, so they already have a physics engine for vehicles. They can start right away. Meanwhile, he was appointed to Sony to make a new PlayStation game, which didn't turn out too well. So I worked on a game called Dark Gun. So after Twisted Metal 2 was a big hit, I was like, I want to do internal development. So Mickey Mania, Twisted 1, Twisted 2 had all been with developers that I had to fly around or get on phone calls and all that shit. And I'm like, I want to try to fucking develop a game internally now so I can actually be with the team all the time and have that experience. And so it was a game called Dark Guns that was abysmal because I had never made a game before, like internally, and I was trying to produce and direct. I'm not a manager. And it was like a two and a half year game that ultimately ended up being an overhead shooter that Sony spent $3 million on and ultimately canceled because it was awful. The fact that uh, I still had a job, let alone they sent me to Santa Monica and make black is, is just more of that pure fucking Sony luck because I just wasted millions of dollars of their money on a stupid fucking game. But it was like college, I got a learning experience. So that's what I was doing while they were doing Road Trip and Critical Depth and all that stuff, I was like, okay, well, I'd love to work on another game with those guys, but I want to have an experience now where I get to be coming into work every day and the programmers and the artists, and the musicians are actually there and I don't have to commute to Utah every couple of weeks. Sadly, the whole thing led to a cancellation. Why did I never hear about this before? There's no reason you would. I mean, it didn't come out. I have a media as fuck design document. We probably spent $100,000 on the design document, which was just full of concept art. And it was like 300 pages long. I still have it to show you how little I knew. And I, I handed this thing out to the studio with pride, like anyone's gonna fucking read a design document. Nobody reads design documents, they never have. You know, Sony didn't know what they were doing at the time in terms of game design. That was a new profession. And if we would have had a mentor there that knew this shit, they would have said, dude, iterate, make a two page fucking design document and let's build something as a prototype. And then if it's good, we'll keep going. You've spent 150 K on art and, and resources for a document. That's a phone book that no one's ever going to look at, but nobody said that. Funny enough, Single Track went on to make an original car combat game themselves with Scott Campbell, co-designer of the Twisted Metal series. It would be called Rogue Trip Vacation 2012, and it was exclusive to PlayStation. And even before that, there was a completely unrelated company that made Vigilante 8, yet another car combat game also exclusive to PlayStation at the time. These two games and Twisted Metal 3 all launched within four months of each other. In 1998, the car combat genre became surprisingly crowded, 
However, Jaffe had no involvement in any of these games, being knee-deep in dark guns. I went down there for one or two meetings just to kind of give them some feedback based on what I knew about making those games, and that was really all I had to do with it. With that said, he had no choice but to let completely different people handle the Twisted Metal franchise. 989 Studios. 989 Studios. Do you know why they called it 989 Studios? It is ridiculous. Because the building that we were in was on the goddamn 989 something boulevard it was the address some of the most creative people working in the video game business what should we name our studio uh what's the address here uh 989 okay that's it let's go home fellas we put in a good day's work while people in this company did have some involvement in the management of Twisted Metal 1 and 2's production, they never actually aided its development. Now, becoming sole developers, Twisted Metal 3 and 4 would both launch in Halloween of 1998 and 1999 respectively. Just like Twisted Metal 2 back in 1996. Spooky. Going from single track to 989 Studios showed a significant change in the game's appearance and presentation. Regarding gameplay, it was worse than Twisted Metal 2. Hell, it was worse than 1. The level design and atmosphere were not very interesting. They also remove small elements such as mid-air steering. You can't turn around while standing still either. A lot of these vehicles simply control like garbage. It's so easy to flip over with a lot of these cars. Wow, nice animation. The thing I didn't really like about Twisted Metal 3 and Twisted Metal 4, I had some problems with the physics because the cars kept turning over and you had to sort of fucking flip them back over. And I know that that was a feature from Rallycross, but I don't think it works in a game like Twisted Metal. Twisted Metal really isn't about driving cars. The cars are sort of a smokescreen. The cars are a window dressing. They are arena brawler characters. They need to be able to rotate in the air. They need to be able to rotate when you're not giving them acceleration. You don't want them flipping over unless that's sort of built into the car's personality where that can be a weakness of the car. Because who the fuck wants to be on their back during a brawl? It's really fucking annoying. Never mind some pointless and irritating mechanics like respawning enemies you just killed for no reason. This isn't challenging, it's just annoying. As for the story aspect, they dropped the stylish motion comic cutscenes in lieu of this horrible 3D animation that looked like shit then and... It's only gotten worse now. The new characters did not look particularly distinct, and any returning drivers would see some unusual changes. Sure, make both drivers for Outlaw Blonde now. Wait, who the fuck is Buzz Roberts? His name was Carl, her name is still Jamie, their vehicle is named Outlaw 3, so I can only assume it's supposed to be the same cops from 1 and 2. Oh haha, ha, angry grandma in the big monster truck, so funny. Mr. Grimm is no longer a skeleton, but now a melting mannequin with hollowed out eyes. My hunger for souls is now insatiable. I've had my fill of mortals. Ugh, these voices now aren't helping matters. Whoa, Amber Rose before Amber Rose. But she doesn't really look like this at all in her ending. Such blatant inconsistency. Pretty sure this isn't even a drawing, just a filtered photo of some poor homeless man. Immortalized in this horridness. Sweet Tooth was especially an abomination. Or needles, whatever. Look at this conscious decision they made with his design. I scream, you scream, we all scream for me! The poor presentation is most apparent in its writing. I'm having trouble seeing any personality in these characters, which only goes as far as how they're dressed. Celebrity wishes to be more famous. Yeah, just like the last celebrity in the same fucking car, but with a lamer ending. Hippie girl wishes to save all the plants in the world. Crazy clown in the ice cream truck wishes for... All the candy and ice cream you want? Your wish is granted. You should have brushed between snacks. Wow, how long did it take you to come up with that one, fellas? Two seconds? That is so ridiculously shallow. Both one and two were meant to show how fucking insane he was. Yes, it's funny. On the surface, he wants a paper bag. But the idea is, even though it wasn't executed well, the guy could have anything. He could live forever. He could have ultimate power. He could have all the money in the world. He literally wants a paper bag that he thinks is his friend, but it's a fucking paper bag. Same thing with the second one, is he could have anything and he wants to be a bug in a garden just so he can murder people as a bug. It's stupid, 
but it's fucking batshit crazy. And I don't think they vibed in with the batshit crazy. I think they vibed in with like, oh, he's a clown. I'm like, well, that's just his costume, man. He's fucking insane. Marcus just looked like some brooding hobo in Twisted Metal 2, but his description and ending showed so much more. While an outsider would label him as some crazy homeless person, the end of his tale in that game would show he was more sane and, dare I say, woke than anyone else. Oh, but forget that. In this game, he's the most generic hobo you can come up with who thinks aliens are talking to him. Spit all over what Jaffe already established. Fine. <laughs> Why is he blonde too? They only took the surface of the IP. But like I said, there's something that I still to this day don't entirely understand that's sort of underneath the floorboards of the Twisted Metal mythos that I think grounds it in something that feels more sinister, that takes itself more seriously. Even the second game where there were some crazy fucking stories going on, there was an aggressivity to it that I don't think you see in 3 and 4. I'm not saying the characters in Twisted Metal 2 are Shakespearean, but you can tell the people involved wanted to give their cast at least some depth and subvert typical expectations cleverly, at least for 90s standards. How on earth can they look at these endings and think they're satisfying in any way, shape, or form? While you can consider Twisted Metal 2 at times to be juvenile, this kind of shit is just infantile. It felt less like the driver's life being ruined due to their own ignorance, but more because Calypso felt like it. So your wish is to forever hang with your homies? Your wish is granted. Let's go! Hang in there, kid. There's always next year's Twisted Metal competition. Is this ending racist, or is me thinking that racist? Regarding Twisted Metal 4, it was more of the same. Ugly characters, ugly animation, ugly game. Although credit where it's due, the vehicles feel significantly better than in 3. Thank god they got that right at least. Something mildly interesting is Sweet Tooth and his apparent army of clowns would unionize to take over the contest, kicking Calypso off his ivory tower, just so they could do the exact same thing. Narratively, what is the point if you're not actually changing the structure in any meaningful way? Sweet Tooth has like two different animations past the introduction, so most of the time, the fucking mascot of the series is only seen in the background juggling. Don't have too much fun with him, guys. He doesn't even have a single line vocally usurped by this hula doll of a clown. An unforgiving environment, one wish made possible by the kindness and intelligence and strength of Sweet Tooth. Maybe I shouldn't complain. The less I see of this horrible design of Sweet Tooth, the better. Oh, Jesus. When I, when I saw the Sweet Tooth character design for three and then four, which was worse, I mean, he looked like a Carney Barker with these stupid uh, neon purple pants. And, and it's like, what is this? Like I've said, Sweet Tooth is me. Sweet Tooth is the darkest, most animalistic side of me. And you guys are turning him into a f joke. Just about the entire playable cast consists of original characters besides an even more bastardized Grimm. Everyone is unsurprisingly lame and forgettable. Yo, what up, ST? Check it, drop a player in a bucket. Heck, trip down hoop ride on chromey, homie, with my name on my props. Aw, yeah, it's gonna be quick. So quick I bounce without my shadow and all that. It seems they're trying to make this wacky and crazy, but went way too far with everything, so we just get these soulless, hideous caricatures with no compelling backgrounds. This is what my pets need to survive. When Jesus fucking Christ. You don't see anything interesting with these drivers. And you certainly didn't see it in the marketing when they had little people clowns dressed up helping Sweet Tooth wash his truck, and I'm like, what the fuck is that? That's not Sweet Tooth. This is bullshit. This is why people think Twisted Metal fans are juggalos. Neither of these titles took any strides in evolving what had already been established in Twisted Metal 2 by David and the folks at Single Track. Nothing was really attempted as a means to improve upon the existing formula. Even the custom car creation was extremely limited and might as well have included an assortment of different vehicles instead. The 989 games just felt like there was no spirit behind what they were making. But maybe we should stop beating these two dead horses because Twisted Metal 3 and 4 were each developed under incredibly claustrophobic schedules. To the credit of the Twisted Metal 3 and 4 teams, and they were different teams within Sony San Diego for the most part, those guys 
were like seven months of development to put a game out. It was like, dude, you have no fucking time. We need it for Christmas. And those guys went above and beyond to sort of put them out. And there are people to this day who are like, oh, those are my favorites. I love Twisted 3. I love Twisted 4. Considering the ridiculously small development window, it's amazing these games even function as well as they do. The games made a shit ton of money for the company. A lot of people still love those games. The teams worked their asses off and delivered. So I don't have any ill will towards those people. I just don't really look at those as proper twisted metal games that fit in that universe. They're kind of like in Vacation where you've got like the cousin removed. It's like, he's not really part of the family. It's like, yeah, he's officially related by blood, but we don't really invite him to all the birthday parties. That's how I think of Twisted Metal 3 and 4. Apologies to the fans of either of these games, but I hope you can see where I'm coming from when I say they just weren't very good. Sure, these titles sold copies, but this era of Twisted Metal is not a very memorable part of the franchise, because it doesn't try to evolve the gameplay and they bear little heart or charm. And where they do try to have charm, it feels forced. Never mind its awful character designs and eye-gouging visuals mixed with putrid animation. I think the fact that Twisted Metal 2 is so universally adored while people rarely ever bring up 3 or 4 speaks volumes on what allows a game to have its own history. The original creators had this set idea in a vague sense what made their game so special. New people come in and try to pin that in plain writing. The problem is that removes the magic those original games had and it just feels extremely contrived. Sony making Twisted Metal 3 and 4, they thought they were cars and they're not cars, they are characters in a brawler that happen to have projectiles. And they're also not wacky crazy, and they're not super dark crazy. They come from a very personal place of B-movie love. And a true B-movie doesn't know it's a B-movie. A true B-movie wears its heart on its sleeve and they just aren't able to express themselves as artistically and as professionally as their big brothers can. And so I think a lot of people either look at Twisted Metal and they make the mistake of thinking they're cars and so they drive like cars and the fundamental gameplay doesn't work that well. Or they make the mistake of looking at Twisted Metal and thinking, oh, it's dark and crazy. And they don't understand that underneath that, there is a genuine love for this kind of B-movie, horror, metal, ambiance, atmosphere, spirit that they try to ape, but they don't feel it at a soulful level. I think those are the two reasons that people have failed to capture what makes Twisted Metal great for the people who love it. They didn't understand the pure American ingenuity that made Twisted Metal so special at the time. That raucous thrill of the first two games didn't come from realistic controls or just being wacky for the sake of it. It came from being as creative as you can, regardless of what you think will seem right to others. Four titles deep, but the franchise has yet to surprise players before it makes its early arrival into the sixth generation with a terrifying entry. Join me and David Jaffe next time as we cover Twisted Metal Black. I waited upon the rooftops for the winner. Being the last survivor of my contest, his prize was one wish. Anything of his desire would be granted by me. All right, Calypso, I did it. I destroyed everyone in this nutty tournament of yours. But I'm thinking my career in this whole thing should be long term. Whatever could you possibly mean, Mr. Perez? This is a yearly tournament, right? Maybe I just got lucky this time around. Maybe I'm not at my full potential. What if I only have the power to get this wish once? I don't just want to be the winner of this contest. I want to win all of them for as long as I live. Calypso, I want my skills to be unmatched by anyone else in the world. I want to be the best. Oh, you want to be the best. <laughs> Your wish is granted. What? No, that's not what I said. Who writes this shit? And with that, I turn the winner of this year's contest into a buzzing bumblebee. Good luck with next year's contest. Maybe you should first figure out how to drive with those new arthropod limbs of yours. I am Calypso, and I thank you for watching Genry's video. Thanks for watching. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss parts two and three of the Twisted Metal Retrospective with David Jaffe. And if you're a fan of games like Dead Rising or No More Heroes, consider checking out some of my other videos while you wait. Hope you stick around.
A very special thank you to Mel McMurrin, the voice of Calypso. Yes, that was him you just heard in that little skit. I cannot thank him enough for providing his iconic voice for this video, and I hope it made a lot of Twisted Metal fans out there happy. And of course, shout out to my patrons for their continuous support. Check out my page on the link below if you're interested in supporting me as well. Mr. Grimm, you've snatched every soul on the planet but mine. Now you want my soul? Your wish is granted!